thanks for everybody uh, hanging in here today. I know it's always tough to do the talk after lunch. <laughs> um, I think from you, when you heard from Dave Nodar today, I'm going to say some things that are similar. I'm going to give you my own experience. Dave's was his experience. Mine is my experience. Everybody has their own experience uniquely because we're all unique, one-of-a-kind masterpieces of the living God. So hopefully there's a pattern in what happens to each one of us that we can relate to one another in. But it's not going to be the same because there's a saying in, in Latin, I, I don't know what it is in Latin, but God uh, communicates in the mode of the hearer. So he's going he's gonna to work and speak in your life in a way that you can understand. Now, it might be dramatic and it might be something like, I love the way Dave said it. He didn't say, my life got turned upside down, my life got turned up right side up. So you may have a, <clears throat> a turning of your lives, and hopefully it's going to be a blessed one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, testimonies amongst Catholics are something that you know we're, we're learning more about. But it's, a testimony is very important because if you look to the scriptures, and <clears throat> I always go to the scriptures because Jesus said you're sorely misled if you don't know the scriptures <clears throat> or the power of God. And you've got confidence in what the scriptures say, the teaching order of the church, and the things that we experience in our own life that line up with those two things. And in Revelation, it's talking about <clears throat> the accuser of the brethren who's the devil who has been cast out. It says, they conquered him, the accuser of the brethren, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. That's in Revelation 12, 11. So <clears throat> when we share our own lives and our own testimonies, what we're really doing is we're banishing and demolishing evil in our midst. So sometimes people are a little bit hesitant to share things, and maybe it's a natural inclination, but maybe it's, it's a spiritual inclination that's in opposition for you sharing things in your own heart. It's important. We need to hear it. Uh, Dave had his life turned around because somebody shared Christ with him. <clears throat> I did the same thing. Uh, when he was talking about the Spirit, the whole thing, the, the game changer is in the Old Testament, he fell upon people, they prophesied, etc. But in the New Testament, he promises that he's going to put the Spirit within us. That's the difference between the Old and the New Testament. The Spirit working upon you and the Spirit working within you. It's, it's, it's B.C. and A.D. It's that, it's that, it's that dramatic. Um, I was a product of the 60s. Uh, I went to college in 65. And I've grown up in a, an Italian Sicilian household. We went to Mass all the time. The family prayed the rosary. He had a big old Bible on the coffee table that nobody ever touched. Okay. Um, and I'm glad I, I, I'm glad I grew up in that environment, don't get me wrong. But it didn't make sense to me until I made an adult decision for the Lord. Then it all made sense, and I was so glad I had that background. Um, when I went to college, I stayed within the Catholic faith for a period of time. Father Valenta was the chaplain at SUNY Binghamton, got to know him. He was my first spiritual director after I sort of found my way back. But then I started seeking as everybody sort of seeks. And in the 60s, we sought in every way that you could possibly seek. And I won't delineate them all because it'll take too long and I don't want to embarrass anybody here. Um, but went after it real hard, you understand? <laughs> uh, and I knew that there was something out there that was missing. I didn't know what it was. So I looked at Zen meditation. I looked at Sufism. I looked at Hinduism. I looked at everything. Got involved with the drug, drug culture. Went out to the West Coast to become a rock and roll star. Uh, came back to New York and got my degree. Um, but before I got my degree, I moved down to New York and was playing music down there as well with my uh, intent on being a professional drummer until I saw the really good guys. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I came back up and I got engaged uh, to be married. And at that point, I started going back to Mass. I, we lived in, in Binghamton on Oak Street. St. Pat's was right up the street. Uh, the, the future Bishop Harrison was the pastor there. I used to go in the morning. Um, it was comforting, but it still was like sort of distant. It was something I was doing, but it really didn't grab me on the inside. Um, and then when we opened up a business, you know, I got a degree in philosophy, and they weren't hiring any philosophers in 1971. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we opened up a macrobiotic restaurant, which basically teaches eating in season, whole foods, and stuff like that. It's called the belly of the whale. Uh, if you don't think my life is prophetic, it's you take a wait until Um But anyway, while I was in the belly of the whale, uh, two of the gals that worked with us 
One was cooking and one was serving tables. They started talking to me about Jesus in a way that I never heard anybody talk about him before. They talked about him like he was a friend and it was like an intimate relationship that he had. And, you know, it sounded really good. And I knew these people from before and they were really good, decent people. But now they were like better people, if you could put it that way. They were happier. There was something about them. They were confident. And so I listened to them. And one day they invited us to go. I dragged my business partner, Larry O'Connor, along with me to their, their church was the Assembly of God. Back then, Catholics didn't go to other Christian denominations. Once I was in a Lutheran church and my friend got married, and that was it. So I walked into this Assembly of God, and it was really weird. People were standing up, and they were praising the Lord, and they were singing, and they were singing, and they were praying in different languages, and they gave testimonies that night, and we came out of there stunned. And if you can imagine, I was at a loss of words. And I said to my brother-in-law, I don't know if what they're saying is true, but I'll tell you one thing. They think what they're saying is true. They really did believe it, okay? And then about a two weeks later, somebody invited me to go to Harper College, where I went to school, into a social hall, and there was going to be a Jewish guy who had come to Christ that was going to give a talk. So I went, and the room was packed. And he spoke that night on the passage from Jacob wrestling with the angel of God. That was his text. It was fascinating, and he you know the story, to recap it, J Jacob wrestled naked before the Lord with his angel, demanded a blessing, the angel came down and crippled his flesh, and Jacob could no longer rely on his own strength. That's the, that's the nut of it. And it, when, the thing, when the talk was over, I went up to this guy, his name was Arthur Katz, and I said, I, I don't know what's happening, I'm here, but I don't know what's happening, why am I here? And he said, you know, I noticed you during the talk, he said, why don't you come, this is a Wednesday night, Friday morning to Harper College, Delaware Hall, at 9 o'clock, we're going to have a meeting of believers. <coughs> I said, I'll be there. <coughs> I had no idea what a meeting of believers was, but I was hooked at that point. You understand, something was happening and it was drawing me. <coughs> I was supposed to cook Friday morning, and in order to be at the college, I had to do the prep the night before, and I asked my wife to go down, and we went down and did the prep at the restaurant the night before on Thursday. And it was a beautiful day in May. It was, it was uh, Thursday before Mother's Day in 1973. Remember how Dave said the exact date he knew when his life changed? I can tell you the exact time and minute when mine did. Everybody's different, but I can tell you mine. And as we, we turned on to Floral Avenue, <clears throat> it was a clear night, but these two clouds came and formed a cross right over my head. And I had this thought. I said, is there a God in the universe that would do a sign for me? And I sort of just tucked it away and we went and did the prep. And then I went there the next morning on Friday. And there was a room full of students. And I don't know if, you know, when you went to school, when I went to school, there were groups of people that hung out together and they didn't mix. The social club people, the druggies, the townies, whatever else the groups you had. But in this room were all the different people were mixed together. People that were wealthy, people that were not so wealthy, people that were very attractive, people that were normal looking people, people that were well dressed, people not so... And I saw back later, and this was, the, this was the church, it includes everybody, there's no segregation. And they shared for an hour about what it was like to live a Christian life on a college campus in the early 70s. And I'll tell you what, it's a hard road to hoe, because there was so much stuff going on. So at the end of it, the gentleman says, we're going to end our session today, we're going to get in a circle and pray. I said, well, I come this far, I'll do this. I have no idea. I never prayed in a circle before. I prayed in the pews. I prayed to Rosemary and all. Didn't know, I have any idea what a standing in a circle and praying was. And he said, he said this thing. As I come along, as the Lord leads me, remember that, Mike? And I pray for you, don't speak in English, but let the Lord bring a, a, a language of praise up through you. And I said, that must be what he was talk, talking about when I heard the assembly of God, whatever. So he gets up and he's almost to me, and something comes out of the deep part of my being. See, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray, because we don't know how to pray as we are. But he utters groans too deep for words. And these words came out of my mouth. Lord, unless you touch me, I'm going to perish. I had no idea what that meant. Of course, I know the scriptures talk about we're not going to perish because Jesus is going to come and save us. But the Holy Spirit knew what I meant. Because, see, I had the Holy Spirit since baptism, but I made him sit on a shelf for a long, long time. And he just 
wanted to, be, it says he's supposed to rule over us. Ah, I'll rule over myself, buddy. You just, see, there's two gifts in Jesus that he came to give us, and, and, and they're both available to us through baptism. One is the gift of the forgiveness of sins, which a lot of people haven't unwrapped yet. The other is the, the power to live the life that he wants us to live. And that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's still, a, it's, it's still a, in a box wrapped up in the, in, the, in the closet someplace. So, when he, when he did lay hands on me, I had an experience that I lost complete awareness of everything around me. And somebody, somebody threw on like 100,000 volts. And I just was filled with this presence of God. And I had an image it was before me, and I saw it was a heart. I knew it was my heart. And the heart was crusted with bricks, and it was crusted with concrete. And out of the middle of that heart, water just gushed out of it, and the bricks and the concrete started to, to dissipate. And I opened my eyes, and the presence of God was so strong. I always say, if I would have had a pen knife with me, I could have cut some of that atmosphere. I'll put it in my pocket, and I could show it to you today. I didn't speak in any languages. I just, you know, I thought I was, you know, I, I was up for anything. I, what I had was just plenty for that day. So I took him back to the guys back to the restaurant. I fed him lunch. They encouraged me in my Christian walk, gave me a copy of this book called Ben Israel, which is his own personal testimony. So Friday night, I worked Friday during the day. Friday night they called me in because the restaurant was busy, not usually. But so I went in and we did uh, like traditional Japanese cooking. I was doing shorter cooking with tempura and stuff. And I'm a drummer. And whether you're drumming or you're putting vegetables into a batter, into the oil, into the out, it's still the same type of thing. It's a motion. It's a rhythm. And I've, and I've done it 100,000 times. But that night, I was doing it with a sense of peace and presence that I had never seen before. I, I tried to alter my consciousness for four or five years in every way that I could to get to some kind of a profound experience. And I'm talking about $100 dangerous. And I didn't lose my mind. Thank you, thank you Jesus. What I experienced that night was more powerful than that. It was no external thing. And I've been spending every minute of my life since that point trying not to alter my consciousness. I want to be conscious of God in my life. Okay, everybody's different. I mean, I'm just telling you, this is my story. Yours is going to be different. So I went home that night, and we had a Bible. And I used to try and read the Bible when I was, I was playing music in New York, and it was like, I don't even know how I had one with me. It was a little blue... Revised Standard New Testament and Psalms. I open it up and I'd look at it and I'd say, this must be the most mystical book in the world because I couldn't understand a thing. Okay? It just was, it was like a wall. I opened up the Bible that night and it was my life. I connected to it. I realized this wasn't something distant. This was a, 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 this was a, a declaration of things that happened in with human beings and these things were happening to me and I'm glad they happened and they were documented all those years ago because it gave me a little bit of a road map and knew what to expect. So that was pretty amazing. The scriptures opened up, and that should happen when the Holy Spirit starts to be awakened in you. See, the Holy Spirit's in you. It's just a matter of, do you want to let him loose? I believe by baptism, the Holy Spirit is within us. When I was received confirmation, I honestly expected the church to open up and the Spirit to come down. It didn't happen. I was very sorely disappointed. I just said, that's, you know, that's a story, forget about that. Until it opened up for me, and that was a different thing, it was my life. So, in Saturday morning, I'm getting ready to go to, to work at the restaurant, and God's got such a sense of humor, he got me on the scripture of Jacob naked before wrestling with the angel of God and demanding a blessing. Here I'm in the shower, and I say to Jesus, I believe what they say about you. I want, I want what you want. I'll do what you want for you to do. It was my, that was my surrender. That was my invitation. See, I'm in sales. You don't get to sell unless you ask. What would you like to buy? How much would you like? Okay. With, with the Lord, you can know all these things about him until you make the invitation. It, that's how you do it. See, people know what, but they don't know how. How is, however it's working within you, you make the invitation. And when I made that invitation in the shower, all of a sudden, the tongues just came up. Spontaneous. And I can understand Peter. You know, Peter was in the boat, and Jesus is walking on the water, and he's scared, and he says to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, call me. And Jesus called him. And so he stepped out of the boat, and he started walking on the water until he saw the waves, and Jesus still rescued him. 
So I fell down on my knees and I said, Lord, if I'm not crazy, make this happen again. <coughs> and he did. Well, if I was crazy, it probably would have happened again anyway. <laughs> you understand? It's not logical what happens. That was Saturday before Mother's Day, 1973. So, the next month on, on Father's Day, my wife had a, 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 I won't go into the story, but she had a very profound, unusual <coughs> encounter with the Holy Spirit in the middle of the night. Where the Lord just told me, shut up, be quiet, just put your hand on it. <laughs> Um, and he took over. See, God wants to interrupt our lives, and he wants to set them right side up. There are certain things about our lives that are really good. You know, I'm not saying that there's not good things, but God has so much more for us, and we just don't understand it. In the scriptures, they, they go out in, 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 in several chapters into the Acts of the Apostles, and they found out they'd only been baptized in the name of Jesus. They'd even heard about the Holy Spirit. So they laid hands on them, they got filled with the Holy Spirit, and they started to speak with tongues. Now, I think tongues are a wonderful gift, like all the spiritual gifts are. The most important thing is that we love one another. Set your hearts on love and eagerly seek after the spiritual gifts. It doesn't say either or, it says both and. Jesus says yes and yes. But if you try to go after the, 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 the pizzazz and you don't have love, you might as well just go back home and drink beer and pizza and watch football. You wouldn't be hurting so many people. Okay? So we need to understand that love is, is, is preeminent in the whole situation. Um, that began, uh, I started teaching very shortly thereafter, I won't tell you how all that thing came together. We started doing Life in the Spirit seminars. I didn't have a Life in the Spirit seminar, God just interrupted my life. But we did Life in the Spirit seminars, we saw lots of people come to the Lord, <clears throat> get filled with the Spirit. My sister Roseanne came down, uh, she went to our, one of our Life in the Spirits, it was at the Spillane's house, they had a, a prayer meeting there. That's after when this happened to me, I said, i got to find me a Catholic priest that's heard about this. And I went and found Jim, Father Jim Fallon, who was one of the first ones in the renewal, and he sort of gave me the context of, yeah, this is Catholic, it's been happening all along, it's just reawakening. And so I felt confidence. I was looking for Jesus. You know, a lot of people have left the church, and I said, Lord, I want you. And he showed me himself in the sacraments, he showed me himself in the fellowship, he showed me himself in the scriptures. I didn't need to go anyplace, he's here. It's me and him. I can, I can dig as deep as I want. In fact, we've probably got more uh, resources in the Catholic Church than other churches have. God bless them. Everybody that believes is a brother. And we've got much more in common than we have that, uh, that tear us apart. It's like I'm a drummer, and I used to see these, these, these rock drummers that had, like, honestly, two bass drums up here, two down here, 17 cymbals, all this stuff. And I'd go down to New York, and I'd find young black drummers that are playing the simplest set that were doing four independent lines that were just blowing my mind away. So most churches have like two sacraments, we've got seven. Shouldn't we be doing a little better loving one another? It's how you use it. You can take the simplest thing and use it. Or you can have a lot of stuff and you can ignore it and it doesn't do any good whatsoever. We've got a wonderful opportunity in the Catholic Church and all these resources and most of us have, you know, we haven't known how to use them, like he said before. So we started to go every morning with two of the, these two gals in the church and myself. We started at 7 o'clock in the morning interceding for our families. We spent an hour in prayer interceding for our families. And we saw conversions. Uh, my sister got converted, adult conversion. She went home and told my parents about it. They never heard about it before at all. My father, just sitting in the chair, just starts speaking in tongues. That's how he was. He just died at 99 and a half this last June. God completely, he said, I, I traveled all over the world in World War II in the Air Force. He says, but the longest journey I ever made was from my head to my heart. Okay. My mother, a little bit more intellectual, she was an intercessor. She died <coughs> early at 53, but she was in the church praying for somebody else, and that's when she started speaking in tongues because her mind was off herself and was on something else. So it happens different to everybody. And you can have it if you want it. If you don't want to have it, you don't have to, you don't want it, you don't have to seek after gifts. But I'm telling you, the state that our spirituality is in and the world is in right now, we need to have every gift that God can give us so that we can have the wisdom and understanding of the th things we need to do. I'll give you an example, just one example of that. Um, in 2001 in May, I woke up one day. I had some side sales business. I'm in sales full time now, but I used to be a corporate manager. And I had a side business, and, the, and I, I felt God speak to me in May, and he said, I want you to stop your side businesses. I just want you to focus on your corporate job, and I want you to spend more time in prayer and study. It's 
probably not the double telling me to spend more time in further study. So I said, I'll do that. I just completely pull, pulled the plug on the other business. And I started spending more time in further study. My son John had graduated from college, and he was in New York working at a, an internship. And he called me up and said, Dad, I've loved it down in New York. I'm finished with my intern hours. I'd like to come home this weekend. Can you come down and get me this weekend? I said, yeah, I can, because I had committed before in May to go to a conference in Detroit that weekend because I pulled the plug on the business. I, did, I wasn't going. So my daughter Gabrielle was home, and we went down. We spent a beautiful day in New York. We drove them back up. It was September 8th, 2011. If I hadn't picked him up on the 11th, he would have taken a train from Queens to the World Trade Center in the morning at 9 o'clock. Did I know what was why God was telling me to stop the side business? I didn't know. Now, was would, it, would he have escaped anyway? I have no idea. But I'm glad that I was obedient, and I'm glad that he was in that God the day that this thing happened in New York. There are little things, but it's not little. It's big. Um, God and does, it says, God indeed does nothing without first revealing it to his servants, the prophets, and by baptism were priests, prophets, and kings. If you need something, God has the ability to give you the gift of understanding and wisdom to meet anything that's in your life. And I'm not saying things are easy. Sometimes they're brutally hard. <clears throat> Count it pure joy, brothers, when every trial comes your way. That's not the way the world is. God's not calling us to live in the world. He's calling us to live in the kingdom. The kingdom in us and through us. So, um, Because I had gone to Mass with my parents all those years, when I started teaching, which was a gift I think God had given me, and it was tested over a number of years, I didn't have to memorize the Scriptures. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with memorizing the Scriptures. But when I needed them, those Scriptures had been deposited week after week after week after week after week, and they just simply popped up and they were there. I was like a, you know, a compendium of Scriptures, even though I didn't know they were there. Everything you've heard, your mind remembers, whether you remember it or not. That's why now, as I'm getting a little older, sometimes I don't remember things quite as quick, and I just say, just take it easy, it's there, and it'll come up. There was something he wanted me to say this afternoon, and I couldn't remember it after he told me at the table until I was talking with somebody at our table, and they said something that made me remember it. So I wrote it down. I need to write things down. So the Holy Spirit is available. Jesus is available to deepen our relationship with, and it's not a one-time thing. You may have a markation and time in your life. And in my life, there, I can tell you when it was B.C. went to A.D. in my life. Now, that happened in history at the year zero for the world. It happened for me in 1973. It was already there, but it wasn't real to me. See, God wants to make it real to all of us. And so... Um, I want you to be open to whatever, I would encourage you to be open to whatever God wants you to give because he gives us gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. Gifts aren't a reward for our holiness. Our holiness is totally a gift from him. United with, it says Jesus has been made our righteousness, our redemption, and our holiness. Jesus is my holiness. If there's any holiness in me, it's because he lives within me, not because Frank's, not, Frank's a total bum. Frank, without him, should have died a long time ago, and I was heading straight toward eternal separation from him. But he said, I got a purpose for this boy, and I'm just going to stay with him until he wakes up. I'm a very, 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 very slow learner, but all of us will have a point where he'll wake us up if we will allow him to. So think about this. You know Lutheran churches, they have like, a lot of times they have a red door on them. Have you seen those? The gifts in speaking in tongues is like, tongues is like the red door. They don't notice the church, they notice the red door. It says it's the least of the gifts, but it's a learning how to surrender. Uh, in, in, in the uh, day of Pentecost, if you read the scriptures carefully, it says they were all gathered in one place, etc., etc. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I heard a teaching on this that says the Trinity is always involved in anything that's beyond just the natural. And the Trinity was involved in Pentecost because the Father gave the Son. He so loved the world, he gave the Son. Jesus suffered unto death on a cross, humbled himself, was raised from the dead. They sent out the Holy Spirit. So the Father had sent the Son. The Son had been raised. He poured out the Holy Spirit. Father and Son did their job. The Holy Spirit gave them utterance. That was his job. And what, is the, what was the uh, disciples' job? 
they began. We just have to take a little step in faith, no matter what it is. It could be tongues, it could be waiting for, we had wonderful testimonies about God had provided resources in people's life, financial, uh, uh, psychological, spiritual. We, we just take a step toward him, draw near to me, draw near to him and he'll draw near to us. Just take a movement to God, all it takes is a little act of will. I love it when Father or, the, or Deacon Bill prepare the chalice and they put the little drop of water into the chalice of wine by the mystery of this mingling of wine. We come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in humanity. And the Lord made me understand, I'm the drop. It's just a drop. But when it goes into the chalice, it's the same thing as what's in the chalice. Our lives are now hidden with Christ and God. We have become partakers of the divine nature. If you don't know what the ultimate goal is, you're always going to be crazy in your mind, unsatisfied. Our ultimate goal and the ultimate goal of every human being is to have total union with the Trinity by His mercy and His grace and the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, the gift of the Father and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit. But He needs the drop. He needs your drop. The community needs our drops together because Rivers of living water will flow from your bellies. That's the, the he said, he's talking about the Spirit. When I give permission to the Spirit to flow in me and through me, and you do too, that conflux of those rivers will drive out the darkness in this area. It'll clear up the air so people can hear the gospel. We'll, we'll see a transformation. We'll see revival. And it's all dependent on us little parts of the body of Christ, all of us together, members of the body of Christ, fitted together functioning properly. I didn't, I didn't even begin to understand that I was part of the body of Christ or even begin to try and ask for the grace to function properly until just before Mother's Day in 1973. And I've been learning ever since, and I'm still learning, and I'm going to learn for all of eternity, and I'm not telling you I do it perfectly. <laughs> ask my wife. <clears throat> but he's given me the grace to continue trying and moving forward and trusting in his mercy. And when I fail, I, we've got the great sacrament of reconciliation where I can just have all that stuff washed away and forgiven. And that's, that's what we've got. It's so incredibly powerful. It's so incredibly precious. And we, I believe, can turn this St. Anthony's community, which is a good community, has a lot of good people with a lot of good hearts, we can make it into more of what Jesus wants it to be. Because his vision is much bigger than... Father's got a wonderful vision. He's a wonderful pastor. I just, I, 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 and, and Dick and Bill, they're just doing a super, super, super job. But what he wants for us is even more than we can ask or imagine. So let's just not put the governors on it and tell them, okay, I'll take this from you, but I don't want this from you. Can we just say, give me what you want me to have that's good for the body and that I need for my own personal sanctification and I can be useful to my family and I can be useful to people in the community and I can be useful to the people <coughs> in the world, and you even give me the grace that I can love my enemies. Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. The call is immense, and I'm telling you what, no human being by their own strength can even come close to doing it. But with him, all things are possible. So we're going to have, and Father's going to talk a little bit about uh, some promises. We go upstairs, there'll be a chance to pray. We'll lay hands out of, we're going to model it for you, just a sense of community. And in Acts 18, 8, 15, it says, they went down and prayed with them that they might receive the Holy Spirit for it had not yet fallen on any of them, for they had been baptized in the name of Jesus. They laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. He just wants to get let loose.